and please, and I certainly hope that will take place as we study Romans chapter 8 this morning. When I typed up the message, I thought I would uh, just use a portion of the chapter, but that's not going to work. And so we're going to, I'm going to read all of Romans chapter 8, uh, and I hope you will uh, follow along in the Word of God. Uh, Romans chapter 8, a lot of folks, Romans is their favorite book, and Romans chapter 8 is their favorite chapter, and verse 28 is their favorite verse. Uh uh, it's such a rich chapter, doctrinally and theologically. There's just so much here. I'm going to talk to you as we get to it from verse number 30, where it talks about being glorified. The title of our message this morning is The Doctrine of Glorification. And uh, it's a blessed hope. But it's a reality. And so you listen as I read, please. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Very important we study and learn. The grammar of this is saying those who walk after the flesh are full of condemnation. If you walk after the Spirit... If you're in Christ, there is no condemnation. That's going to come up again in a later verse. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Remember Jesus said in the gospel of John, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now again, the word walk is not meaning just going for a stroll or, or like I do of a morning walking with the bulldog pup or something. It means our whole manner of life, our philosophy of life, our whole behavior is taken into this word walk. So we walk not after chalk, not after the flesh, but we walk in the Spirit, after the Spirit, all right? Verse number uh, five, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Notice the grammar of that. It, it, not it says it can be or should be or ought to be. It says it is. It's very important that we see that. Because, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You wonder why lost people don't believe in God it's because they can't. They're born with this enmity. I preached uh, last week, abolished enmity. God has dealt with that, thus enabling us to believe. It's wonderful grace. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. You see these absolute truths the great apostle is giving us. The Spirit dwells in you. God's going to raise you up. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. But if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. 
In Colossians chapter 3, if we are then risen with Christ, it says mortify the flesh. Now in the, just in the simplest definition of that word mortify, it means to crucify. But when you take it in the definition in its context, that definition expands a little bit. You see, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. I don't have to crucify myself. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. What does the mortician do? The mortician is not an executioner. He's not killing people for job security. He deals with the dead. And you see, we're to deal with our bodies as if dead to sin, but alive to Christ. 13 But if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the Spirit again of fear, the Spirit of again to fear, but ye have received, definitely, absolutely. Ye have received the Spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, where have you heard that phrase, Abba, Father, before? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Abba, Father, nevertheless, not my will, yet thine be done. You see, folks, this great doctrine of adoption enables us to have the same relationship with Almighty God that the Almighty Son of God has. The adoption, he put the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, all right? Verse 16, If the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There again, there's such great security and assurance in this chapter. 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may may be also glorified together. You see, and that's listed and I mean... uh, Uh, presented to us here as an absolute. An absolute. Remember that. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now the word reckon here is an accounting term. It's not something he's thinking about and hopes that it works out. But it means taking all the facts involved in the discussion, this is the absolute answer. We shall have this glory. It shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Can you see the absolute security in that? We shall be delivered. Man, I don't have a hope so salvation. It's based on biblical and theological truth. And it's absolute And we can take that and run with it and live with it and work with it and raise our children by it and govern our homes by it. Verse 22, for we know. You notice as you read the writings of the Apostle Paul how many times he says, no you not, no you not. He expects us to live and function and operate from a position of knowledge. Not just a bunch of hopes and ambitions. Not only they, but ourselves all. Verse 20, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, to understand, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Now remember Hebrews chapter 6. Our hope is a person. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the anchor for our souls. He's not anchored to this world. He's anchored in heaven. So our hope is personal, it's real, and it's anchored out of this world. Remember that, all right? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Who can possibly come up with the right terminology to speak to the Most High God? You ever meet somebody really, really important and you think, man, I wouldn't know what to say. Well, how can we, with, with even our, our most intellectual people in the world, they would not know what to speak adequately and reverently enough for the Most High God. So the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities. You pray, you pour your heart out to God. The Holy Ghost gets a hold of your prayers and he makes them holy. It makes them acceptable to God. Makes your prayers adequate for worship to the Most High God. He helps our infirmities. That's why the child can pray with a scholar. You see. We, we don't have to... I would be done. I would be absolutely doomed if I had to get everything worded, phrased just right to present to God. I'd be doomed. The Holy Spirit helps us. I need to hurry on. 28, 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. There again you see that we know. We know. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. I mean, folks, man alive, when God declares us innocent, who's going to change that? You see, people can accuse me. It's like Dr. Bob Lasilia said. He said, isn't it sad when the devil accuses us to God he doesn't have to lie? He's telling the truth about us. But you see, Jesus Christ has washed away our sin and God has justified us. So who can condemn us? Verse 1 said, there's therefore now no condemnation. And we're going to see, if I get there, <laughs> I hope, to the connection in all of this. All right? Uh, 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. How can someone condemn me? Christ died for my sins. He rose from the dead, ascended up into heaven, and is interceding for me in the presence of God right there. You see, 1 John 2, 1 and 2, my little children, these things write unto you that sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And you read John 14, 15, we have an advocate in our hearts. The comforter, same word translated comforter is translated advocate. We have an advocate with the God in heaven, and that's good. That takes care of things in heaven, but I'm still down here. And I need some assurance down here. So God has given me the comforter. In 1 John 2, he translated it advocate. In, in John 14 and 15, he translated it comforter. Because we still sin. We don't brag about it. We're not proud of it. But that's reality. That's honesty. If any man say he have no sins, a liar. And the truth is not in him. So we see, he says, he glorified us. Verse number 30. 
Moreover whom, notice the grammar of this. Moreover whom he did predestinate, verse 29, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. To, be, to what? To be conformed to the image of God's Son. The image of His Son. Do you understand something, folks? One of these days I'm going to be exactly like Jesus Christ. I'm not there yet. Now then, I don't want to bore you with, with a lot of tense Greek tense here, but you need to understand something. Notice how God says this. The foreknowledge has already taken place. The predestination has already taken place. The, the calling has already taken place. 1 Peter chapter 2. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't that something? You notice that you study about that call, 2 Timothy 1.9, it's a holy calling. It's a high calling, Philippians tells us. It's a heavenly calling, we read in Ephesians. It's an enabling call. It's a delivering call. Remember, Jesus comes up to the grave of Lazarus, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus says, no, I think I'll stay in here. It's cooler and not near as dusty. No, God said, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened? He came forth. God says to me, come out of sin, and I came out of sin. It's an enabling call. You see, we're saved because God calls us out of our sin, calls us out of our darkness, and then into something. That's the wonderful part of it all. He didn't just call me out of darkness and then leave me dangling because I'd have turned around and gone back. Hmm? He calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. But he did foreknow us. He did predestinate us. Verse 30. Moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Now the grammar of the calling here is exactly the same aorist active indicative tense. I don't know. That's not going to mean anything to you. But unless you make the connection to every one of these great truths, then you'll understand it. So the foreknowledge is done and accomplished. The predestination is done and accomplished. The calling is done and accomplished. It's completed. Jesus died on the cross, John 19, 30. He said what? Well, I did my best. Let's see what comes of this. No, he said it's finished. It's finished. You get that? How many of you got projects around the house that aren't finished? Huh? Isn't that kind of sad? Well, Jesus finished. He didn't say, I did my best. Let's see what happens. He didn't say, man, I tried awful hard. I hope this works. It's done. It's done. It wasn't something he tried. He did it. He finished it. He completed it exactly. It wasn't something he heard from somebody else. He said, I think I can do that. I like doing tree work. I've cut, a bu bunch of, I've cut 30 trees down on the Arlington Baptist College campus, if you can imagine it. <laughs> You'd think it looked like a desert, but it's still plenty of trees. But when I was in Pennsylvania, a, a, a guy that was a professional logger taught me, he says, when you've got a tree that's fallen the wrong way, sometimes you can hinge it on one side, and as it begins to fall, you can spin it. And it'll come like that, in the process of falling. Well, I said, I think I can do that. So I was on an oak tree about that big around, and I wedged it out, and I came through the back, and I left too much hinge on this side. So here that tree comes, and it goes. <laughs> Next thing you know, I throw that saw down, and I'm high-tailing it. <laughs> Where are you going with that, preacher? Jesus is on the, the crucifixion. It wasn't something he said, well, I'm going to try this and see if it'll work. It was the sovereign plan of a holy, majestic God, and he finished it. It said he did foreknow, he did predestinate, he did call, and he did justify. All of that's done. Just, excuse me, justification we went to court. We were guilty. 
God's the holy judge. He took our sin and crucified his son. Guilt made him study it. He was made sin for us. It's an amazing transaction that a holy God would make his holy sinless son become guilty on the cross. You wonder why you're worthy to be called God's son? Why, how can God forgive me? How can God be merciful to me? Well, he punished his son. Hebrews 2.9, he tasted death for every man. He experienced that death that our sin calls for. And so we are justified. But then look what he says. And then he also glorified. Still the aorist active indicative. It hasn't taken place yet, but in the mind of God it's done. You understand something? Think about the marriage supper of the Lamb. This, we're we're going to eat in a little bit, all right? So just be patient. <laughs> That's easy for me to say. I'm the most impatient person I know, and then I'm going to stand up here and tell other people to be patient. <laughs> anyway, all right? Imagine the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's not going to be any empty seats. Oh, what happened to old Chuck? Uh, he, he messed up and didn't make it. He ran somebody off the road in 303 and he got vexed at him. And... No. We are glorified, folks. It's done. It's done. I, 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 read, I read what Matthew Henry said about this. I read what John Gill, I read what A.T. Robertson has said here. I read what... Uh, Kenneth Wiest has said the simplest explanation of this I read I read this morning from a little book on Romans by Dr. J. Frank Norris and he said this I didn't pay I wrote it down I didn't pay for my calling I didn't earn my predestination I didn't work for my justification and all hell can't keep me from my glorification. Amen. Can you understand this blessed truth? Folks, we're going to heaven and nobody can undo it. Well, they say, yeah, but I, I, know, I know Chuck. <laughs> so what? You can't undo the atonement. You can't undo this. So understanding the grammar of this. this I, I'm going to hurry through this real quick. We read in verse 23, the glorification is the redemption of this body, this old corpse that gains weight when you don't want to. When I, think about it. When I needed to gain weight, I couldn't. When I was in high school, they said, Chuck, keep your arms out or you'll go down the drain. I was so long and lanky. I, I was this tall, 170 pounds. I ate like a meat hog. I couldn't gain weight for love nor money. If I could resurrect my dad, put him here, he'd tell you. I drank a gallon of milk every day of the world. Trying to gain, I couldn't gain weight for nothing. 40. <laughs> Amen. I'm not playing basketball anymore. I don't need to gain any weight. I need to lose weight. <laughs> One of these days, we're going to have a heavenly body. The knees aren't going to have to be replaced. Not going to have a bad back, bad heart, or bad attitude. You see. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, it's, it's presented to us as this corruption putting off its incorruption and putting on immortality. That's what glorification is, folks. I'm, 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 I'm hurrying, believe it or not. In, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, glorification is presented to us as putting on our house, which is from heaven. Wow. You talk about a place. I had a summertime job in Houston back in, uh, well, I left there in 1973. Some of y'all weren't even a nightmare yet. All right. 
But in 1971, I got to go through a house. We buried the telephone service for this house. In 1971, it was a $500,000 home. And I got to walk through that thing. Wow. Wow. We went up a while back on a vacation. We got to go walk through the, the, the Breaker's Mansion. 22 bathrooms in that mansion. Every bathroom has a bathtub cut out of a solid piece of marble. 22 of them. Walls completely, solid sheet of silver. It's unbelievable. I have a home in heaven prepared for me by the Son of God. I have in heaven a body prepared for that glorious home. Man alive. You see, aren't you? What kind of heaven would it be, Brother Carlos, if we had to go to heaven and fight blood sugar? Be none of that problem. They've got some things on the back about me. Getting older and all of this, it says, getting sweeter, not a chance. <laughs> well, Brother Carlos has the opposite problem. He's getting sweeter all the time <laughs> with that blood sugar and, he, uh, and foolishness, vexation of spirit. The glorification, all sickness, all disease, all causes of sin are done away. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll take on this immortality. Glorification takes place in heaven, not here. No one here has been glorified. When I first came to Arlington, go to the Arlington Baptist College, I got a job working at a steel warehouse on Singleton in Dallas. And there were three of us that worked, lived in the dorms at the Arlington Baptist College. Uh, and then there were three preacher boys from the Assembly of God College in Waxahachie. And we all worked in there cutting, cutting steel to links and all of this. We get to horsing around. We worked at night so that all of the supervision was gone. That doesn't sound intelligent, but that's the way it was anyway. So we get the orders all cut. We'd get to horsing around. We had to wear hard hats and safety glasses all the time. But we get to throw an empty pop cans at one another, cold drink cans. And one of those Assembly of God boys bent over to pick up a pop can. When he did, his hard hat fell off. When he looked up, I drilled him right there. I did a lot of pitching playing baseball, so I hit what I throw at. He looked up, and I drilled him right there. Those boys, we'd argue and argue and argue because they said they're glorified. They're glorified. You drill one of them right there with a pop can, you're going to find out right quick he's not glorified. <laughs> All right? Man, I mean, he was unhappy and unholy. That's as far as we'll go with that. All right? We're not glorified in this life. We're still dragging around. But Paul says, this same writer in Romans 7, he said, Oh, wretched man that I am. He didn't say, oh, wretched man that my mother-in-law was, or, or this person, oh, me. Glorification, we're not going to have to deal with this anymore. Anymore. Now, very quickly, understand this. No one can enter heaven who has not been glorified. How many times this same writer says, flesh and blood shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember Jesus, you can't go to heaven unless you've been born again. You can't be glorified unless you've been born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I'm hurrying. He says in Matthew 5, 20, unless your, sin, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll no case enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't go to heaven unless you've been justified, unless God has dealt with your guilt, you see. You can't enter heaven unless you've been sanctified. Look with me very quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Another thing about being glorified, you're not going to have to try to outrun a clock all the time. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Well, no wonder that didn't look right. It's 2 Corinthians 6. We want to be in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse 9. Know you not? There he goes again, expecting us to have this knowledge. All right? 
Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous are those that have not been justified. Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. That takes in, that word fornication, not just premarital sex. It takes in every area of perversion, if you study it out, all right? Nor idolaters, nor abusers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor idolaters, I'm sorry, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but what a wonderful word. Get this additional truth. That's what that word but means. Ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now back to Romans 8 real quick. And we're going to look at the security of this. The security of this glorification. Romans chapter 8. The revelation tells us that they'll no way enter anything that defileth. 27 of Revelation 21, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You can't go to heaven just because you want to. Again, I've, I've told you this before, folks, and it, it, it's alarming, it's terrifying to me, the people that I meet, that they want to go to heaven, and that's all they want. They want to go to heaven, they don't want to go to hell, they don't want any more to do with God than that. I can't help them. And the Bible offers them nothing. I mean, if all you want to do is miss hell, tough tomatoes. If you don't want God... You don't want to be sanctified. You don't want God governing your life. See, it's a sad thing, folks. We've got people all over the place telling us they're born again children of God, but they live like they're never going to leave this world. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. You see? Now, Romans chapter 8. Verse 1 and verse 34, there's no condemnation, none. You say, well, what if I sin? It's dealt with. Christ died for you. You say, well, how does that happen? It's a miracle. It's a theological fact, but it's a miracle of grace. We can't ex I can't explain to you how God forgives all of our sin. I can't explain that. You know, I, I, you, when I was teaching theology, I'd tell the class, I can't explain any of this. I can just give you the facts. You see, by faith, we understand. There's no accusation. Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? They got nothing to say. Some of you have heard that song, What Sin? What Sin? You see, the devil would accuse us to God. We have an advocate with the Father. What sin's he talking about? I washed that away. It's gone. There's two times in Hebrews 8, 12, and 10, 17, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. It's a fascinating thought. No condemnation, no accusation. Verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? No opposition. I've had people tell me, I wish I had $10 for every time someone's told me, oh, I could never be a preacher. Boy, if God calls you, you'll be able to, because he'll be right with you. Oh, I could never be a missionary. My goodness, God gets with you. No one can stand in your way. My older sister, she and I, we loved one another, but we were so diametrically opposed in our philosophies and all of this, but she said to me one time, she said, you Baptists think you get the will of God, you can run over anybody. I said, well, that's not in the Bible, but I wouldn't want to get in the way. If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, old Goliath thought he'd jump up at 10 feet tall. Talk about a big man. See, the kid killed him. 
Sennacherib shows up with 185,000. He is the big Assyrian. He really thinks something. One day, God wiped them all out. Remember the flood? If God be for us, who can be against us? God help us to remember that. No limitation, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Everything that we need. Second Peter calls it all things that pertain to life and godliness. I'm hurrying. And then verse 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No separation. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, absolutely convinced, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor power of things present nor things come nor height nor death nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And again, I, I read you what J. Frank Norris said. And again, this is after I read all of these other guys. He said, I didn't pay for my calling. I didn't earn my predestination. I didn't work for my justification. And all hell can't keep me from my glorification. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So, God help us to live in this. When Paul's talking about glorification in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, how does he, how does he end it at all? How does he end it all? How does this apply to our life? How do we put this in shoe leather? What do we do with this? He says, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You see, folks, our glorification is absolute. We're going. We're going. And again, don't get troubled if someone gets mad at you and tells you to go to hell. Don't get mad. That's a great opportunity to witness. You're not going. Explain to them why. Let's stand together. Ask our musicians to come. Been a little bit long this morning. I hope you can...